And if this is your first week here, I'm sorry. All right. Are we live? Yeah, good. I'm trying to share this with people. How do you share Instagram stuff? I don't get this. Eh, I'll I'll send it to them later. <laughs> I like I figured out how to use Facebook, sort of, and I kind of just gave up on social media. So, like, I technically have Instagram, but I haven't figured out how to use it. Um, I have someone else you do my Instagram, actually. <laughs> um, but she's not very good. She doesn't post. Um, <laughs> stop derailing me. <laughs> All right. So today we are in Nehemiah 4. And um, I'm just going to read it all through the entire chapter and then uh, open us in prayer. So, <clears throat> Nehemiah 4, opposition to the work. Now, when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews, and he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sins be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashadites heard that the repairing of the walls of J Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry, and they plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us 10 times, you must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction, and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah, who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me, and I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread. And we are separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by, day, by night and, by labor, and may labor by day. So neither I, nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, None of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you know more than anyone. You know more than me how weak we are and how weak I am. <laughs> so, Lord, I pray that you would just remove me from this space and that you would speak through me and that 
we would all hear your word, that we would receive your power, and that we would go forth from this place uh, renewed with renewed strength, with, with renewed vigor. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so the passage of today's sermon is Rebuilding Invites Opposition. So, has anyone here played the game Risk? Raise your hand if you have. All right, so I've been playing a lot of Risk online. Uh, and if you've played Risk, <laughs> you know that it's a strategy game and you're trying to like use your armies to take over the entire world. And you know that there are some people who always put their armies like in one spot and they try to like just take over as much land as possible on their turn until they've completely weakened themselves. And it's not a good strategy because you could take out like take over a whole bunch of land, but if you don't have strong borders, then you know that the next round not only are going to not only are you going to lose the land that you just gained, but you'll probably lose the territory that you had before because someone's just going to come and sweep through with more power. So I've actually been playing Risk Online against the computer, and the computer, even on expert level, level doesn't understand the strategy, and they'll just do this again and again, and it's so easy to wipe them out. So it doesn't matter like how much they take over, they'll be destroyed if they don't have a strong border. So where we're looking at in here, and I know that Nate's gone over this before, but we're looking at Jerusalem. Jerusalem's wall has been torn down. And they're, they're weak, they're vulnerable, and they need to rebuild the wall to have strengthened borders so they don't get attacked and wiped out. So Nehemiah and the Jews understood this. They understood that if you're surrounded by enemies, you need to have a defense. So all of this time, they've been concentrating on nothing else but rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. And as Nate has been going through this, I hope you've understood this spiritual connection here is we're not just talking about a historical instance where some people were building a wall. What we're doing is we're seeing the parallels between what was happening in Jerusalem here and our lives. So as we are sanctified, as Christ is building us up, as he is rebuilding us after we have been saved, we see a lot of parallels to this text. And... Again, today I'm talking about how rebuilding invites opposition. So as we are going down this path of sanctification, there will be opposition to the work that God is doing in us. There will be. So the, the, I have three points, and it's alliterative because it needs to be. <laughs> Nate knows. <laughs> so the first point is that rebuilding invites Derision. And if you don't know this word, derision means like mockery, scorn, insults. So we see this right at the beginning of the passage. We see two people, Sanballat and Tobiah, and they're looking at the Jews rebuilding the temple, and they're like, ha, you think you can do this? You can't do this. And they're, they're just mocking constantly. You see, they say, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? So, first of all, as we go through life, and as if you're a Christian and if you're saved and if you're following Christ, you will receive derision from the world. And how do I know this? So, I've received some mockery from non believers as I've followed Christ. Not a whole lot, but I've been called naive, I've been called ignorant, I've been called names for choosing to follow Christ and believe what this book says. But I know that I'm going to experience more of this, because if we look at Luke 22, 65, sorry, 63 to 65, it says this about Jesus. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. So if Jesus received mockery, I know that we are going to receive mockery and division, derision in life from the world. Because 1 Peter 4.13 says, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings 
that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is renewed. So we know that since we see time and time again, Jesus is mocked and scorned, that if we choose to follow him, as we share in his sufferings, we too will receive mockery and scorn from the world. And this is going to happen. But not only that, because that, I feel like, if you have a thick enough skin, it doesn't matter. Like, some people even like being mocked. They're like, <laughs> I can take it. But not only will we, will we receive derision from the world, we're going to receive derision from Satan. We're going to be mocked by the forces of evil. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, I've, I've felt that much more than mockery from the world. If I look at this passage where it says, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? I don't hear other people looking at me and saying that. What I hear is the devil looking at me and saying, what is this feeble Sam doing? Is he going to bring himself up by himself? Is he going to resist this temptation by himself? What is he doing? He's failed so many times before. Look at what you've done. You're just going to keep failing. So what I'm talking about here is spiritual battle. Not only are we going to receive derision and mockery from the world, we are going to experience spiritual battle. We are going to have Satan and the forces of hell come up against us and mock us. And I'm going to get into to this more as to how this can affect us. But just know that as we choose to follow Christ, the one who is sworn to be against Christ will be against us. But look at Nehemiah's response to the mockery of Sanballat and Tobiah. So in verses 4 and 5, what Nehemiah says is, Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads. What Nehemiah does is he doesn't go back and confront them. What he does is he immediately turns to prayer. He acknowledges that it is not by human power that this wall is being built. It's by God's power. So he also knows that what Sambalat and Tobiah, who, who they're mocking, is not the Jews. They're mocking God. And so Nehemiah is like, it's not up to me to defend my honor. God, defend your honor. Because they're attacking what you're doing. They're calling you weak. And so th th this is what he says. He says, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. They've provoked you, not they've provoked us. To him, he sees himself out of the picture. He says, this is between Sambalot and Tobiah and God. So God, do something. <laughs> and too often, we like to rise to the challenge of someone mocking us and be like, I can think of a clever response. I can think of a clever retort. He's attacking me, so I'm going to attack him back even harder. All right, so that's the first point. Rebuilding invites derision, and we'll receive it from the world. We'll receive it from Satan. But what's next? Rebuilding invites doubt. Part two, uh, point two. It'll come up. So what we see, starting in verse 10, we see something very interesting. We see, in Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. Where have I heard that before? Look back at verse 2, where it says, in the words of Sambalot, will they restore it for themselves? Back up here, what the Jews are saying, we ourselves will not be able to rebuild the wall. They are taking what they have heard from the world and they are internalizing it. They are turning it into doubt. They are beginning to doubt, we, we probably won't be able to do this. Everyone's saying we won't be able to do this. I guess it's true. So mockery, if not immediately turned over to God, will be internalized and turned into doubt. 
Notice what exactly Sambalot and Tobiah are attacking. Again, they're not, they're not attacking God because they don't believe in God. And I just said earlier they are attacking God. They are attacking God, but in their minds, they're attacking the people. And so their specific insults are saying, will they restore it for themselves? And so this doubt that the people are having, it's caused because they are looking inward. They're hearing the, the insults, and they're looking inward, and they're saying, well, I guess I don't have the power to do this thing. I guess I'm not strong enough to accomplish this task that has been set out for me. And I'll be honest, I have been attacked so much this week in this regard. As I've been preparing to speak and come up tonight, I have been attacked again and again and again with, Sam, you don't have this together. You haven't prepared enough. You don't have jokes like Nate. You can't keep people's attention. You're not funny. You're not witty. You're just going to stand up there and look like a fool, and everyone's going to sleep. And those doubts have just kept coming back and back again. And if I hear those doubts and I just look inward, they're going to be confirmed. But what does Nehemiah do? In verse 14, And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, he doesn't say, you are strong enough, you can do this. Don't listen to the doubt. Pull yourself up. He says, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. He immediately turns to who God is. He turns to praise. He says, look at the, at the Lord who is great and awesome. Look at the Lord. I, I'm going, so I'm going to recommend two books tonight. <laughs> And you might be like, oh my gosh, two books. I can't read two books. I promise they're both really easy to read. So the first one is this, The Screwtape Letters. And it looks like a really thick book, but it's really not, because you look at this and the text is really big. You can read this in a week. And even if you read one section a day, which will take like five minutes, you'll be done in a month. But this is by C.S. Lewis, and it is from the perspective of a demon and it explores all the ins and outs of spiritual battle. And it is one of the most life-changing books besides the Bible that I've ever read. But listen to this passage. It says, again, from the perspective of a demon, talking to another demon and coaching him on how to tempt and how to dissuade his human from God. This is what it says. Keep his mind on the inner life. He thinks his conversion is something inside him, and his attention is therefore chiefly turned at present to the state of his own mind, or rather to that very expert, expurgated version of them, which is all you should allow him to see. So Satan, when he, when he mocks us and when he plants the seed of doubt in us, he wants the result for us to look inside ourselves and just examine ourselves. If we can get like trapped in a loop of self-examination, the devil's happy. Because you know what that will cause? That will cause doubt, which will then cause us to look away from God, which will cause us to sin, which will cause more doubt, which will cause us to look away from God. And it's just this loop where we just keep looking at ourselves and like, oh, woe is me, I'm terrible. But Nehemiah has the solution. He says, look to God. Look to the Lord, who is great and awesome. Stop looking at yourself. Stop it. Look at God. And this, this, this is where I'm going to introduce my second book that you need to read. And you can't even really call this a book. It's like a little booklet. You can read it in an hour. It's called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness by Timothy Keller. The most I, with no exaggeration, the most impactful book in my life, like not including the Bible. Get it and read it. You can buy it for like three bucks on Amazon. It won't come for like three weeks because of the stuff going on. But, 
order it and then read it. Because what it, it argues is that a lot of the issues we come across in the Christian life are because we are so focused on ourselves. And that once we realize the freedom of forgetting ourselves, we will truly learn to live the Christian life. All right, so I've gone through two points. This is going to be really short tonight, guys. So um, the first point, rebuilding invites derision. The second point, rebuilding invites doubt. And the third point is rebuilding invites danger. So if we see all the way back in verse 8, we see the, the very real danger that the Jews are facing. It says, and they all plotted together. This is the people who, like Sambalot and Tobias people. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And again, later, later down, uh, it says, and our enemy said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. So they, they are facing the really the very real threat of being attacked and killed. And something that I've noticed is that a lot of Christians today think about salvation as a one and done thing. So I have gone up to the pew, to the altar, I've given my life to Christ, I've been baptized, and now I'm a Christian. Now I don't have to think about this Bible stuff anymore. I can go to church every Sunday, but I'm good. I, I've been saved. And that's, that's very true. You are saved, but there are still very real dangers facing you. Look at 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, where it says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour Resist him, firm in faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brothers throughout the world. So this language, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, that's not like gentle language. That's a very real danger. I would hate to be stalked by a lion who's super hungry. So... We need to be, like this passage says, sober-minded, watchful. We can't let down our guard. People, so one of, the, probably the most famous verse in all of Nehemiah is just one part of a verse. It's, it's just two, three, four, six words. And it takes place in, in Nehemiah 4, verse 20, where it says, our God will fight for us. And it's a very good verse great verse. What people will do is they'll take that verse and they'll be like, our God will fight for us. I'm good. <laughs> I'm going to go watch some Netflix. <laughs> it, it's so taken out of context. What this passage is saying, you, you look through, what are Nehemiah and the people doing? They are holding weapons as they're building. They have one sword in one hand and they have a hammer in the other and they're like, all right, so I hold my sword right up here, and I go, ding, 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 build the wall in this hand. It's like Minecraft. <laughs> Although in Minecraft, you can't hold both at the same time, can you? No. <laughs> I've never played Minecraft, or it's been a while. <laughs> so what specific... <laughs> Do you say Fortnite? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Shouldn't have mentioned that. Okay. But, like, what dangers are we specifically talking about? We're talking about the dangers of temptation, the dangers of distraction, the danger of doubt, like we've already talked about. The devil does not want us to continue down our path of sanctification. The devil wants to turn us away from God. And he's going to throw everything he can at us. So what do we do? Yes, we recognize that God will fight for us, but we're going to use all the weapons at our disposal to be ready to fight back, right? 
If we want to win something, we're not going to just sit down and wait for it to happen, not prepared. We are going to be prepared for when the attack will happen. So God has armed us with, he's armed us with his word. He's armed us with prayer. He's armed us with community, with the church, with accountability. Are we armed with them? Look at uh, like Ephesians, is it, what is it? Ephesians 6, I think. Armor of God, Ephesians 6. Look at Ephesians 6, armor of God. Everything that he's given you is just lined out there and given like really cool images to associate with them. I tell you, I, I've experienced more spiritual battle this past week than I think I have in the past year. And it's not an accident or it's not coincidental because A, Satan wanted me to be distracted from bringing this message. He wanted me to, like we've already covered, he wanted me to doubt instead of trusting in God. But it backfired on him because the amount of spiritual battle that I have experienced this week has God used to strengthen my message tonight. It gave me, so I wasn't just like saying abstract things. I've experienced this this past week. But I can tell you that I am terrible at spiritual battle. And I can probably assume that most people are. Actually, I can assume that all people are. We're terrible at spiritual battle, even after we're saved. As much as I have succeeded in spiritual battle this week, I've failed utterly. I've just rolled over and given in. But thankfully, this is where Christ enters the picture. Because... Christ has already won the, bat, the, the war. We might face, we will face some smaller battles, and we are called to fight, to pick up the sword, and in one hand take the hammer, take, in one hand hold the sword. But the, the war is already done. Our enemy is already defeated. We've tasted victory, so we can use that confidence. We look to Christ and we say, you've already won the battle for us. You are fighting for me in this moment, in this smaller battle. That gives us confidence to fight. It doesn't negate the need to fight. It just lets us know that we will not be utterly destroyed by what Satan throws at us. If we're in Christ. So fight daily. Take up that sword. Take the armor of God and fight. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are Lord of all. You are the victor. You are the one who fights for us. You are the one who enables us to fight. You are the one who has given us your word. You're the one who's given us the church. You're the one who has given us this amazing community of brothers and sisters where we can turn in our weakness and say, Lord, you are strong. So God, I pray that as we go out from this place, as we go into our workplaces, as we go into uh, our homes, as we go into whatever form of school looks like right now, Lord, I pray that you would keep us strong as you are strong, that you would Help us to fight. Lord, you are good. You are great. You are awesome. And it's in your holy and precious name that I say amen.